So, of course, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, doing a fantastic job. Uh, and I wish you all the best of luck in this very beautiful institute and lots of serendipity because that's going to help. <laughs> Hard work, I know you will do. Um, okay, so. Oh, which is. I thought it was appropriate to start with um, the Crick and Jones commentary from 03, Backwardness of Human Neuroanatomy. Uh, it's glorious that we've heard a lot of progress since then. Uh, we can discuss later whether fundamentally we stay at the same point that uh, compared with where we would like to be, where hopefully we will be in uh, X amount of time, uh, it is still backward. Um, and the reason for that, there are many, of course, uh, you've already heard, uh, there are problems with getting the, uh, and this talk is going to be mainly neuroanatomy. So uh, we'll be, I'll be reviewing uh, some of the things that we've gone over, uh, and then giving you specifically the perspective from uh, axons. The uh, problems with neuroanatomy, uh, human neuroanatomy in particular, are uh, accessibility of the, uh, of the tissue. Postmortem samples have their own problem. We've just heard about the problems of uh, surgical samples. Then, in addition, the uh, sample sizes are very small because the brain is very big. And then we have these, these very problematic gaps uh, of comparison. So which, uh, how many species do we need to a sample? You can't do exhaustively, but we need at least sampling. And a, uh, I am more and more preoccupied with the gap of uh, chimpanzee. <coughs> so we can say, <coughs> excuse me, uh, peak, uh, peak jet lag, I think. Um, we can say with some confidence that things are primate specific, but are they human specific? And what might help here would be to have a, a larger uh, comparison perhaps with chimpanzee, which is going to be difficult. Uh, so what I have organized the talk <coughs> is in terms, the first part is a, a very quick survey over neuroanatomical cherry picking, neuroanatomical uh, examples of where we might look for differences, and that is going to be mainly cellular. So cellular, uh, subcellular, supracellular, and macro. In the second part, I will uh, go back to my older work on single axons. <coughs> Excuse me. And as Christoph has uh, told us very nicely, the perspective from axons are a little bit different from um, the neuron perspective. And in particular, you uh, really get a, a feeling of this thing that I'm going to call heterogeneity and uh, share with you uh, what I think I mean by that. Uh, the second, so the first conclusion is there seems to be no single feature, as far as we know, <clears throat> that characterizes the human neuroanatomically. Uh, there are, however, more of things, and in particular, there are more relationships, more combinations. So uh, the eight things that I'm going to go, go through rather quickly, uh, when, you th when you think neuroanatomically, <clears throat> about human specific, one of the first things you might think of is, as we've heard, the large giant cephalic brain. But in point of fact, there are other brains that are larger, and you've seen these names already. Uh, I haven't done much work myself in comparative, but it is um, a useful uh, start for, well, uh, neuroanatomically, uh, what is big, how do you count, what is more? And all of these things are very difficult, but have been done by, by various people. The bottom line with uh, size, of course, is, um, well, sim simplified. The elephant brain, mass-wise, is larger. Um, in terms of total number of neurons, there are more neurons, but most of those are in the cerebellum. We actually haven't heard much about the cerebellum. Uh, and probably is a little bit different domain than, than the cortex, uh, would be worth going into in more detail. Uh, the main difference in terms of large gyrencephalic 
is usually that uh, we, if we look in the cortex, there is a phenomenon of encephalization, and there the human does a little bit better than the um, elephant and probably <clears throat> the uh, cetaceans. I want to say just two words on the on gyrencephalic. There are not only <coughs> excuse me, not only uh, larger brains, but the gyrencephalic. And the, uh, there is more and more literature on the folds themselves. Uh, number one, what causes the folds? And number two, uh, what are the differences? A little bit less in the differences. Um, the folding pattern, as I'm sure you know, is moderately stereotyped uh, the major for the major cell site <coughs> across uh, individuals. Uh, the mechanism of folding is uh, there have been various theories. Uh, one of uh, an interesting recent one, the last few years, is the role of uh, a genetic um, gene expression microdomains in early development. So this is from uh, Gorel, is a middle author here. Deletion of this <coughs> cellular adhesion gene uh, will result in rather dramatic folding in a mouse. So this is knockout for this FLRT1213. Uh, and it tends also to have some laterality. So you can see a very dramatic uh, folding on one side, I believe it's the left, and just a little gracious uh, undulation on the other side. That the gene, not only can you uh, produce folds in the mouse, but apparently in the uh, in human and in, or at least in the uh, ferret, and I believe in monkey or ferret at any rate, uh, zones of low expression of this uh, um, <coughs> cell adhesion molecule uh, seem to mark the uh, major uh, cell site, and uh, the mechanism uh, may be at least in part related to differences in migration speed. Um, there is a, rather an older paper from the Zillis group uh, reporting age-related morphological trends in the cortical sulci, so they're not completely static. They vary in terms of width and depth over the lifespan. And then, of course, known for 100 plus years by the architectonic community, you're going to have differences in the layers depth of the, uh, the folds, the cell site, <clears throat> the deeper layers get scrunched. So it was very convenient for uh, localizing things. But if you visualize that in, in the <clears throat> context of connections, uh, you see it also has some implications in terms of the uh, predominant verticality of the walls of the cell site, where uh, here the cell bodies and the apical dendrites are not in perfect register, but rather uh, distort and converge. Uh, number two, neuron types, <clears throat> and we've already heard that there is, um, so far, and <clears throat> given the amount of work, probably uh, unlikely to expect human-specific uh, types of neurons. This is on, based on morphology. There was a good deal of excitement a few years ago on the spindle cells or phonoconimo cells, which are very thin and uh, seem to be uh, predominantly uh, have certain predominance in human, although also appearing in uh, bonomos and chimpanzees. <clears throat> but since then, and I, I would say but, <clears throat> the uh, neurons have also been found in, in many other species, including non-primates. Non Bet cells, of course, are prominent in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, primates, in humans, but also in uh, non-human primates. What you do see, however, is differences in arrangement. So uh, Javier, in particular, has, has done some very nice work in showing uh, differences. This is in a cat, but he also has human, <coughs> uh, the B1, B2, and TE. Differences in the proportions of different calcium binding <coughs> proteins uh, into neurons. Uh, staying with neurons, uh, there are, as we've heard, uh, differences in neuron numbers. Uh, and this was done, by, among other people, uh, Javier, with uh, all sorts of, of numeric uh, analyses, <coughs> which are very interesting. Uh, I'm going to emphasize a little bit the arrangement, not just numbers of neurons, but how they're arranged. That's what we just saw. Excuse me. 
uh, here, how are they arranged in the different, in different layers, and the same thing here. This was actually new to me, but the uh, elephant has more dispersal, in other words, more intracellular space, and I think we'll hear about that more uh, with Macon uh, in the astrocytes uh, than in human. And this gets us back to an older concept <clears throat> of a cell packing density, where neurons are packed uh, closer together in the rodent, both mouse and rat, uh, then in primate, and then apparently here in the elephant, we have even more uh, spacing. Um, so, there are differences in, uh, in size, differences in packing density, and uh, that really gets you <coughs> to another question, fundamental question, um, not just what makes, it, what makes us human, but what are neurons? And uh, once you, uh, as we go in a few, a few slides into the axons, okay, neurons, uh, we often look at them for cell bodies, but of course they're uh, dendrites, um, and uh, then, a little bit less studied, but uh, Christoph showed his beautiful results now becoming possible with light sheet, light sheet uh, uh, technology. Neuron is here, but it has extension. Uh, there are local collaterals and ex uh, extrinsic targets, often more than one. Uh, and then we can start thinking, well, what happens at branch points? Is there a failure of, of uh, transmission, a selective transmission? And you can start looking at the numbers, uh, just simply counting the synapses. <clears throat> Typically, local collaterals will have uh, upwards, you will be counting in the thousands of synapses. In other words, synapsing on thousands of postsynaptic neurons, whereas the extrinsic collaterals at least for cortical in the monkey will tend to be more in the hundreds. That's only a rule of thumb and oversimplified to some extent. Uh, before I go back to the uh, axon, the extended neuron, and actually, uh, 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 per, uh, by parenthesis, there's uh, very little data on the total neuron, the, both the total neuron, ex, uh, whole neuron, as Christoph had said, of the extrinsic collaterals, in relation to the intrinsic collaterals. Um, and probably there's some idea from the Parent group that there's conservation. If you have a lot of uh, local collaterals, you'll have fewer uh, extrinsic, both, but fewer. Uh, the extended neuron also, of course, includes things like perineuronal nets that we're seeing here. Some have them, some don't. And um, receptor distribution. The Zillis group, of course, <coughs> has done uh, extensive work over the years. And the most, one of the more recent papers is uh, charting 15 neurotransmitter receptors over 44 areas, and they have comparisons, at least for some of these, of human and macaque. <coughs> and of course, we could also do uh, other species. Not surprisingly, there are differences. Um, how we go from one to the other of species, I think is a little bit less clear. What are the rules? What are the transformations? And these are average heat maps, so what are the, uh, how does this relate to the postsynaptic neuron? All of which are very difficult questions to access. So we have just heard a beautiful talk on uh, synaptic organization. Various, <coughs> excuse me, various people are working now <coughs> on human, uh, human tissue EM. Uh, Javier de Felipe, for one. And uh, this was a slide from uh, Joachim Lübke at uh, ULIC comparing uh, synapses in rat, uh, in rat uh, somatosensory cortex versus in human. And they have identified uh, what seem like functionally significant differences. The active zones in human are larger, total pool, uh, vesicles uh, is larger, there are more synaptic uh, contacts. He also reports astrocytic in, in, in the ensheathment. So altogether, does this, does this anatomically suggest a high synaptic efficiency? Is it human-specific? Well, this says difference between human and a rat. 
uh, and then we have gaps. What about the other species in other areas? Uh, I think I'm going to go quickly over this part, that uh, there's a lot of modular organization in the cortex, not just verticality, but different grouping. Let me come back to this. One of the more obvious, of course, <clears throat> are the cell islands in uh, entorhinal cortex. Uh, this is from uh, Inselsti, uh, Bert, uh, Mikhail Brecht in Berlin, who's also done a very nice comparative study using calbindin in different species. Uh, the smallest mammalian brain being the Etruscan tree shrew, uh, mouse, rat, bat, and then human. Uh, using calbindin as a stain that stains both interneurons and uh, pyramidal neurons in this area. And there are, of course, differences in size. Um, uh, there also would be differences in, in cell type. I think, and this is easy to see, but a uh, perhaps more interesting example is the in visual cortex, the uh, organization of layer 4A. Uh, 4A sits above 4C. It is a geniculate recipient. And uh, Todd Preuss, <coughs> years ago already, had done a, a battery of, of uh, stains, basic uh, stains in a postmortem tissue uh, for calbindin, uh, non phosphorylated neurofilament, and showed a wide variety of organization in this layer in the different uh, primate subprimate and primate species. His point was that the uh, <clears throat> 4A in human uh, was different than 4A in the other animals um, neurochemically and also in a way that seemed to suggest that this was a different organization of the magnocellular versus the uh, parvocellular uh, pathway. So this again comes back to the theme of how things are arranged. You may have the same elements, but they're arranged in different uh, ways. Uh, a seventh example going down the list is, of course, neurochemistry. <clears throat> and I could have given, if I were working in that area, a whole talk on the uh, differences in uh, neurochemistry in the different cortical er areas, different cortical layers. Uh, if I remember correctly, serotonin is, a preferential, is, is densest in, this, in the temporal regions and uh, dopamine in the frontal, noradrenaline in the parietal areas, we could go finer. But uh, an interesting example, as an example, is neurochemistry of the thalamus. So this is from uh, Carmen Cavada, uh, comparing the uh, <coughs> uh, macaque and rat. Uh, the red stuff here is showing you dopamine concentration, which is obviously much higher in the thalamus in the monkey than in the, in the uh, rat. That has implications, of course, for how the thalamus is going to be interacting with the cortex. Another major difference, uh, <coughs> which um, we know, but I, I don't know really has been uh, exploited, is a lack of GABAergic neurons in the rodent, uh, with the exception of uh, the lateral geniculate. Uh, compared with the uh, primate. Staying with the thalamus before we move to axons, uh, this takes us back to the issue of um, two points, really. One, the difference in inhibition. So in the primate, I just said that you have uh, inhibitory interneurons in primate thalamus. Uh, in the rodent, only in one small area, and I'm not sure which creature that they're illustrating here. But let's look at, look at here. So number one, a difference, and it, it, what I'm doing here is just listing, uh, but this actually points out not just uh, a list, but a relationship. So as the interneurons increased in species-specific manner, the density of cells in the reticular nucleus of the thalamus uh, became less, decreased. Uh, so this is something where one can start to make predictions, start to look for rules in, uh, throughout the, uh, 
two more uh, species. Another difference in uh, which is accessible to quantification and relationships is uh, the, relation, the cortical thalamic uh, pathway, which originates from uh, layer five and layer six. And it's a very robust <coughs> species conserved uh, phenomenon where you have a large number of layer six neurons uh, terminating in a um, very di divergent pathway in the thalamus and a small number of layer five neurons, it looks like it's four, but it's really layer five, uh, which terminate in a very focal pathway. Uh, we can, let me pass over the terminations, but two points here, the uh, ratio of layer five to layer six will vary from area to area, as was shown by several people here, I'm quoting uh, <coughs> the Helen Barbus group, and probably also species to species. So this is something that could be uh, um, pursued as an assay of, uh, of differences and perhaps linked with functional uh, implications. Uh, a second thing is the relationship of the intracortical collateral. So once you start changing the cortical thalamic uh, connectivity through the reticular thalamus, and then you have to also consider how does that impact on the small local collaterals of layer six and the very widespread collaterals, intracortical collaterals of layer five. <clears throat> okay, so let me shift gears a little bit and, con and uh, conclude with a series of slides on axons. Um, I would agree with, uh, with Christoph, this is very obvious. Uh, once you start looking at axons, the uh, order that you can sense to some extent in the neurons a little bit disappears. So is there a different order or what is happening? And uh, one of a fairly recent paper from, uh, this was Tony, a collaboration with Tony Zadar, uh, used a combination of axon reconstruction in the mouse. This is mouse visual cortex. Uh, a small number of manually reconstructed neurons combined with barcoding. Uh, so all together, the barcoding allowed, okay, here are your numbers, 30 manually reconstructed neurons, or it was using the uh, two photon and 553 <coughs> barcoded. Uh, the result was, however, that even in mouse primary visual cortex, they are reporting two major connectionally defined populations. One, uh, dedicated neurons, which is the smallest one, so V1 to one area, and then uh, broadcasting neurons going to two, three, four, five, or seven other areas um, in, in a combination that seemed um, non-random, but the rules are still um, outstanding. So uh, once you go to single axons, then uh, this is layer five from Keta and Keta in the, in the rat, and the neurons are here, and you can see, sure, they're, they're very widespread, uh, but let's go a little bit deeper. You have local collaterals <clears throat> and uh, numerous extrinsic collaterals, and uh, the rule is, is unclear. Some have abundant local collaterals, some don't, and they don't go to exactly the same combination of uh, subcortical areas. That um, phenomenon of heterogeneity comes up again and again and again if you're looking at single axons. So there are several groups who had uh, done intracellular, intraaxonal filling uh, of genicular cortical axons. And this is a, a typical parvocellular neuron, <coughs> excuse me, neurocellular parvocellular termination, and it is, as, as you would uh, classically textbook expect, terminating in 4C beta, but you also have a little bit in layer six. Uh, the sample size is extremely small here, so we don't know the proportion that goes just to layer of 4, 4C and what goes to 4C and six. But I think if we did know that proportion, uh, it would tell us something about how these axons behave. Now, in the, in the last few slides, going back to my own old work, 
Um, this was based on uh, tracer injections in vivo in the uh, monkey brain, uh, tracer injections of anterograde tracer BDA. And uh, then we manually, I'm not sure we would do the same thing uh, today, but at that point, in, which was going back in the um, 89 was the first paper, uh, it was one of the few ways to look at uh, whole axon uh, reconstruction. So this is what a uh, focus looks like when you're averaging together many, many terminations. Uh, the technique here was to go for a fairly well isolated arbor. Uh, here is your axon. This is the main uh, the termination, the main axon. And this is the part that we would trace uh, back through serial sections. The key here was to have strict serial sections. This is uh, progressively higher magnification. Note that this is an axon, even though you might mistake it for a dendrite. Uh, but if you look closely, yes, there are these spines. They're not dense as if they were a dendrite. These are the uh, stalked glutton uh, termino. <coughs> and then you also have the beaded. It's a mix of stalked and beaded uh, terminations. So this is a somewhat busy slide. I'm going to uh, show you just two systems of, of connections. Uh, these would be feed forward, I suppose. Uh, V1 to V2 in the monkey, and then we're going to look at V1 to MT. Um, I think what we can just concentrate here. The point is, from one injection site, uh, these are low magnification horizontal sections, showing your injection site, and the arrow, this is V1, we're going to V2, not very far distant. Um, the neuron is lost in the injection site. We don't have the local collaterals, so that we know from other material that the collaterals would be probably two to three millimeters from the side, each side of the neuron. Um, but this was going back quite a ways now, 1990. Uh, I don't know the relationship of the neurons in the uh, injection site. They could be near each other. They could be a little bit far. They are probably layer three. And the arrows are showing you uh, one focus of, of uh, converging neurons. This is from animal seven. Uh, and the number is the axon. The other number that's important to note, and I don't think you can see it, <clears throat> is these are 50 micron sections. Uh, every 20 numbers, in other words, gives you one millimeter in the Z, collapsed Z direction. Uh, and the numbers, which are too small here to see, uh, would allow you to read that Z connection in the uh, decades before we had our light sheet. Uh, but notice here, and these were axons, uh, that we did follow back a little bit further so we know that they're not branched. Uh, one arbor, three arbors, uh, two arbors, and sort of diffuse. Uh, when you get to MT, uh, the same thing, uh, heterogeneity. And this is just the uh, extrinsic connections in, in uh, V1 to MT. Here there is a rule. Uh, most of them have two arbors. And they all had layer six collaterals. So unlike your, your standard early visual pathway, it is not just a layer three to layer four, but a four and a little bit layer six. Uh, these neurons, of course, uh, they originate from <coughs> neurons in, in V1. Uh, and those cells are known to project. Uh, this is in uh, Marmoset from another group using uh, retrograde uh, tracers. And uh, the potential targets are uh, V1 to MT, another extra striate area superior colliculus. Using retrograde tracers, they found that the projections were in all combinations. Uh, this was my attempt to uh, superimpose. Uh, this is not from the same neuron, but an extrinsic connection in uh, MT and the intrinsic arbor in uh, V1. These neurons in, uh, from uh, minor cells in layer six are uh, extremely specialized. So here is your uh, collateral tree, uh, wider even than the, uh, the standard V1, <laughs> layer three or layer five in the uh, primate. Uh, and I think, whoops, to conclude, <laughs> oh no. Okay. 
Can I get back to the last, last uh, slide? I could take questions. Okay. Let me jump to the last slide. It's 20 something or other. Nope, before. Before. And, um, yeah, okay. So I wanted to conclude with uh, another quotation. Uh, and this is, I'm not sure if I succeeded in sharing with you this idea of heterogeneity. Uh, of course, it's very nice to think of, of uniformity. Uh, but having looked at the perspective of axons all this time, uh, I felt, I ended up feeling that, yes, uh, you have exquisite homogeneity in structures such as the uh, limulus uh, omotidium. Uh, the limulus eye, the compound eye. Uh, what we tend to have more in the, uh, another metaphor for the uh, cortical connections, this was taken from uh, June National Geographic, of uh, uh, this connection, connection network of the forest, uh, what they call talking trees, of how the trees uh, look isolated when you are at the top, but they actually have a very rich, uh, symbiotic uh, network below the, uh, below the uh, forest uh, floor. And then I took a quote, recent one, from uh, Jeff Lichtman. Uh, what is missing from canonical circuits, this being uh, an extreme caricature, uh, what if the differences between the connectivity uh, are important to uh, circuit function? What happens when the synaptic connections of one class of neurons individuate in response to differences in the activity patterns within another class of neurons. So, so I think it's very important as we move forward, one, to have uh, more comparisons within a brain between species, and then, of course, the relationships. How do these neurons, these, these networks, thousands of neurons interconnected, how are they responding to other uh, neurons in the network? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>